All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk uh, today at uh, the Emerging West Forum at, as part of the Open Source Summit North America. Well, uh, my journey with open source sort of started uh, back in 2019 when I attended uh, my first ever international talk, uh, international conference at Open Source Summit uh, Europe. That took place in Lyon in 2019. And uh, I mean, I really loved my experience over there, and I felt that, OK, I mean, I want to attend each and every developer conference. But of course, COVID struck. Uh, I got to be part of a lot of virtual conferences, and this happens to be my second open source summit, but this time as speaker and not as an attendee. So I'm really excited for this. And it's really good to see so many people uh, coming here. Uh, of course, today's topic is going to be demystifying WebAssembly through the eyes of a beginner. Um, we have had a lot of WebAssembly talks, especially in like you know in, in this year and in the past couple of years. And um, this talk really sort of covers some of the misconceptions that people have, because I myself have given a lot of different talks on WebAssembly, and I have had the experience of working on various spectrums within WebAssembly. But there is still these common questions and these common misconceptions that usually come to place when, whenever I talk about WebAssembly to someone who is not aware about uh, this terminology. So this talk is really meant to sort of uncover some of those, uh, or sort of uh, like you know resolve some of those misconceptions, uh, and also sort of look at WebAssembly from the eyes of a beginner, so that for those uh, folks who are not aware of WebAssembly, they can at least get some idea and can get excited about the wonderful world that we are living in. I mean, you probably might have already uh, covered some of the top uh, uh, talks that have uh, taken place over here. But uh, yeah, I mean, this sort of this think of this as a refresher and something that you can take with you since we are at the last day of the conference. So something to take with you uh, as we uh, conclude today's uh, Open Source Summit North America. With that in mind, I'll get started. A very quick introduction about myself. I'm Shivai. I'm a developer advocate uh, or developer relations engineer at MilliSearch, which is a Rust-based open source search engine. It's an alternative to Elasticsearch. Um, and I'm also a contributor to Layer 5, which is the service mesh community uh, as part of the CNCF. And if you want to uh, connect with me, you can connect with me on uh, how to develop. Now, moving on to the first misconception. And that is WebAssembly is a programming language. Well, I mean, if you sort of break down WebAssembly into two words, that's web and assembly. I mean, I'll come back to the web part later, but the initial one is assembly, right? A lot of times you'll attribute assembly as the assembly language. So if you look uh, on a broader spectrum of how programming languages from high level to the machine code, they sort of uh, work is that you probably use a like you know, high level language that gets, uh, and you, you basically use a compiler to compile it to assembly language, and finally you get to the bytecode, uh, which is essentially like you know, uh, the machine level language that is what is the zeros and ones that interacts with your CPU and with your um, uh, computer resources. But WebAssembly is not like, you know, an assembly language. And it is not just for the web. And that's one of the misconceptions that we'll be coming on to later. Well, what WebAssembly is really is, it's an efficient low-level bytecode. Now, of course, we'll sort of break it down for everyone, for those who are especially uh, like, you know, coming here for the first time and who are hearing about WebAssembly for the first time, that what exactly is this efficient low-level bytecode? And then, you like you know I'm using some more technical jargons over here, such as it is portable, it is language agnostic, it's a compilation target. So just think of it as like you know this kind of a uh, technology where it's not like a programming language, right? So I mean, all of you might be familiar with JavaScript, Rust, C++. So it's not that. It's not uh, a programming language that you can actually write into and just like you know go ahead and compile it. Think of it in this way that. Of course, all of you might be aware of how machine language sort of looks like, right? It's a co it's combination of zeros and ones. So that's what WebAssembly is more sort of near to. It's a low-level bytecode uh, representation. That means the representation will be in the format of uh, collections of zeros and ones. And it is really portable. What that means is that essentially how bytecode, how this WebAssembly bytecode works is that um, you can take multiple languages, for example, C++, C, Rust, right? And then you can compile them into this bytecode. And that is the bytecode that uh, is the WebAssembly bytecode. And how is it portable? That it's, it can be used in multiple places. It can be used within the browser. It can be used uh, as part of, like, let's say, a server. And you can use it across multiple devices. It's not just limited to your web browser. It can be used in edge devices. It can be used in server-side uh, like, you know, uh, hardware. 
and uh, that's what WebAssembly is all about, right? And of course, as we cover more and more in depth regarding how WebAssembly is actually used in multiple places, we'll sort of get into the next and nitty and gritties of how WebAssembly actually works. And uh, coming to uh, like you know uh, sort of understanding how WebAssembly architecture sort of looks like. So think of it in this way that if all you all of you must be aware of uh, how stacks work, right? So a stack is a data structure that uh, sort of follows a first in first out uh, representation. That means whenever you put or you insert uh, something inside a stack, um, it's sort of like you know the whatever item is at the end, it will always come out at the end. Whatever is at the top will always come at the top. So that's how the memory management within uh, WebAssembly module also works. But of course, coming to the technical jargons a bit later, we'll move to the next part, and this is what exactly like you know WebAssembly sort of looks like. Instead of uh, think of it as like you know a very simple, easy to understand C++, this is what a hello world in WebAssembly sort of looks like. It's a combination of digits, uh, zeros and ones, and of course, uh, like you know hexadecimal format that you can see over here. Uh, this is what WebAssembly truly represents. And of course, like you know, if you were thinking that hey, I would want to write my own WebAssembly. Um, you can see the complexity. Of course, it's not something that's not, it's not impossible, but at the same time, you can see that uh, it's much more easier to actually write your programs in a higher level language like C++ or Java as compared to actually writing it in WebAssembly. Uh, one of the other ones, like you know, the biggest mis uh, misconceptions that people usually have is that they think that WebAssembly is actually a replacement for JavaScript, and it is actually faster than JavaScript. So coming back to the representation of why WebAssembly was started in the first place. So all of us know that JavaScript is a really great language. Uh, today, JavaScript is one of the most popular languages, and especially when it comes to web browsers. Uh, I don't think so there is any language that is going to be replacing uh, JavaScript uh, for implementation. But it does come with its own set of limitations. One of the biggest ones is that whenever it comes to a more complex uh, calculation, a lot of mathematical crunching, right? That's where uh, the way is fundamentally how JavaScript works, it sort of fails in that. I, I mean, it's not it's something that it's not possible. It's not impossible to do these large mathematical calculations. So things like doing machine learning inference, neural network inference, which essentially is a combination of huge matrices, or doing things like uh, video editing, right? Which usually involves a lot of mathematics and number crunching. It's possible to do with JavaScript, but it's a very slow process. And that's where WebAssembly sort of comes into the picture. So the idea is that you can actually take your more highly performant applications, uh, program programming languages like C++ or Rust, and then basically compile them into uh, uh, the WebAssembly. And essentially, uh, you can think of WebAssembly as a compilation target. That means that uh, you can take your highly performant uh, programming languages like C++ or uh, Rust, and you can compile them into this WebAssembly bytecode or this WebAssembly executable. Because generally, how browsers work is that browsers only usually allow you to actually run JavaScript. They do not allow you to run any other programming languages like C++ or Rust natively directly in the browser. Because usually, how JavaScript also works is that it actually works inside of a sandbox environment. So. One of the other ways in which you can actually run Rust or C++-based languages inside of your web browser is with the help of WebAssembly. Because uh, you essentially run WebAssembly uh, executable inside of that same sandbox environment in which you're also running your JavaScript. And that's, how, that's one of the ways in which you can actually utilize the power of programming languages like C++ or Rust. So what we are uh, essentially doing is, and of course I'll come to the fun bit a bit later, uh, what essentially we are doing is that we are sort of offloading all of our highly computational tasks uh, that usually involve a lot of like, you know, serialization or a lot of number crunching uh, to be actually handled by the WebAssembly. And we are just sort of using JavaScript along with the WebAssembly. So WebAssembly in itself is something that cannot do a lot, of, lot on its own. Uh, it's a very low-level uh, system, so it cannot even ex uh, like, you know, get uh, resources such as the file resources or network resources on its own. You have to usually combine it with other um, like, you know, languages like, like, let's say, JavaScript to actually truly utilize the power of WebAssembly. So that is why WebAssembly is not going to be replacing JavaScript anytime soon or at the same time, uh, like you know, you cannot just run WebAssembly on the browser. You still need some kind of a language like JavaScript to actually invoke uh, to be used on, like let's say, the DOM, which essentially is the bare bones of uh, how the uh, like you know, the modern browsers work. 
And actually, I mean, today, this morning, I was just looking at some, like, you know, to come up with some fun memes, uh, like, you know, with WebAssembly, because, um, like, you know, a lot of times uh, people, again, like, this, this is a myth that WebAssembly can actually replace JavaScript. So one of these was, like, you know, uh, I mean, traditional programmers who use C++, they're trying to hit, of course, I mean, we do not recommend violence, but yes, I mean, this is how generally people perceive WebAssembly, right? That they are going to be hitting JavaScript out of the park, and they're going to be the rulers of the uh, of the web. Uh, and of course, this one is really a fun, fun one that uh, people have ended their friendship with JavaScript, and they are becoming best friends with uh, WebAssembly. But of course, all of this is false. And um, essentially, what is that? You know, WebAssembly and JavaScript are great friends because they really work well together with each, with each other. Because what really hap what is really happening is that essentially uh, you're uh, like, and I'll come back to this particular slide in a bit, but essentially what is happening is that you're offloading your major tasks uh, or highly conventional tasks from JavaScript to WebAssembly. And essentially, uh, since, like, you know, as I mentioned, that WebAssembly itself cannot really do a lot, you are uh, instituting in uh, all of your WebAssembly calls, or basically, uh, whenever you're wanting to actually use WebAssembly, you're using JavaScript APIs to uh, basically uh, call your WebAssembly uh, module and then utilize that to do all these highly inference uh, activities. And uh, this is how one of the ways in which you can actually use WebAssembly. So essentially, as I mentioned, that you take your C++ code, uh, source code, and uh, there's uh, like, you know, basically a format in which you can actually convert that into the WebAssembly bytecode or the WebAssembly module using something known as inscripting. And uh, essentially, you're going to be using that with your HTML document. So essentially, what you're doing is that you're going to be uh, fetching your WebAssembly uh, module inside of your JavaScript application, and then you're going to be use, utilizing it with the help of JS APIs. And of course, I mean, uh, that's just one of the ways. Of course, there are a lot of other ways in which you can actually use WebAssembly uh, with uh, your uh, application. So you could also actually just uh, like you know, write a Rust application and then directly uh, compile it into a WebAssembly target. Or you can use something like assembly script, which uh, is very similar to TypeScript, that essentially converts directly into WebAssembly by executable. But of course, one of the most, uh, most widely used ones is essentially taking, like let's say, a C++ application. Uh, uh, application with them script in. And a really great example for this is FFmpeg. So if you're not aware of FFmpeg, it's a very uh, popular uh, like, you know, library that has been written in C++ for doing anything related to video editing. And uh, so one of the examples is like if you're dealing a lot with uh, like, you know, video editing or you're like, let's say, cropping, merging videos, uh, you can essentially uh, comp use uh, that uh, FFmpeg package that has been written in C++ and then port it over into a uh, web browser to do a lot of these, uh, like, you know, uh, web browsers. Today, uh, there are a lot of different video editors that actually use the FFmpeg uh, module, WebAssembly module, to be able to do all uh, things like, like, you know, being able to combine videos, merging videos together. Um, so we have a lot of really powerful in-browser video editors that are in use today. Uh, so these are some of the ways in which you can actually use WebAssembly inside of your uh, web application. But of course, the biggest myth of all, right, that WebAssembly, because of the word, like, you know, web and assembly, WebAssembly is just for the web. And it's not true, right? Um, of course, if you have been attending some of these sessions that uh, have taken place in uh, this conference, uh, you might be aware that WebAssembly today is being used not just in the web, but also in uh, server side on edge. And that's one of the biggest uh, myths that people have, right? Uh, of course, the, the other two myths that we covered, those are more sort of when you actually get into uh, WebAssembly and you really understand what WebAssembly is. But this is probably the biggest misconception out of all of the ones that we have covered. And uh, it sort of is like, you know, a completely true that um, the way WebAssembly, like, you know, it was form formulated. So uh, the standards around WebAssembly sort of started back in 2015, and 2015 onwards, it sort of really picked up. Uh, originally, the origins of WebAssembly sort of started from the assembly uh, .asm files, and that, that is sort of the beginning of WebAssembly. And uh, I, I think I was watching this one of these talks recently where they mentioned that um, to be honest, like, you know, how WebAssembly really is, is that it is portable and it is native, right? So we should have probably called it web native. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, at that time, native word itself in tech was not formulated and coined. So I'm talking about, like, you know, 2019 when the CNCF and cloud native truly actually came into being. Uh, but yes, it is a bit misleading, but at the same time, like, you know, it's fun that we are now seeing the applications of WebAssembly not just in the browser. 
And that's where, like, you know, uh, I mean, this particular definition does not stand true. That, of course, we know that it's efficient, it is a low-level bytecode, but it's not just for the web. In fact, it is also portable, right? Today, we can use uh, WebAssembly on the server side, on the browser, on the edge, on IoT devices, and these are, of course, just some of the examples uh, that we have today in the entire spectrum of WebAssembly. And of course, the ecosystem sort of just goes on and on. So these are just some of the examples. So Crustlet is essentially a project that allows, uh, so if, you have, uh, if you're aware about kubelets uh, uh, and uh, Kubernetes, uh, Crustlet is a project that allows for, uh, like in order you to run WebAssembly applications in Rust. Then we have Cloudflare workers that allow for very easy uh, management for like, you know, CDNs and distributed networks. Um, then we have the Microsoft Flight Simulator. And a lot of different games today have been actually ported over from their native C++ or in actually in Unity uh, directly to be uh, used directly in web browsers with the help of WebAssembly. Then we have things like Adobe Lightroom. Uh, I actually just happened to meet one of the uh, folks who, were, who was uh, working at Adobe uh, within this conference and they actually gave a talk. Uh, so uh, Adobe Lightroom on the browser actually uses uh, WebAssembly. And Figma, of course, a lot of uh, us who are web designers might be using uh, Figma. Uh, that also uses, uh, so all the UI components are written in React, but essentially all the things that deals with whenever you are, like let's say, creating a new design, all of them are using C++ behind the scenes and it uses some scripting to actually, uh, with the help of WebAssembly, to do all those uh, heavy lifting tasks. And of course, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, so coming to uh, some of the run times, right? So we're now moving from the browser to the server side and towards containers, right? So we are sort of moving away from the world of web uh, browsers and now we're coming into uh, the world of backend, in, into the world of uh, servers and uh, containers, uh, right? So these are some, some of the really popular uh, WebAssembly runtimes. So we have Wasm Time, we have Wasm Edge, and of course uh, you can actually look at 20 plus different types of WebAssembly runtimes that allow you to actually run web, WebAssembly executables or WebAssembly models in uh, the server side. And you can just follow this link on GitHub to uh, see some of the other WebAssembly runtimes as well. And of course we have some uh, dedicated WebAssembly platforms. We have folks from uh, Wasm Cloud as well and Fermion as well over here. So thank you so much for attending this talk. Um, with essentially are redefining the way in which like, you know, applications are deployed and how uh, you can actually use WebAssembly for things like platform as a service to very easily spin up and deploy applications um, having a really small uh, runtime. And uh, this is just one of the applications uh, where you can actually use WebAssembly with Node.js. So uh, I first of all, credits to Second State for uh, presenting uh, this particular uh, uh, architecture. So what you can actually see over here is that the standard Node.js uh, backend, or I mean the runtime, like you know, uh, usually like with V8, uh, those are usually written in uh, C++. And um, of course, one of the issues that we probably uh, you might be aware of uh, with uh, Node.js specifically is that uh, usually in mo in most contexts it is single threaded. Uh, of course, you can make it multi-threaded as well, but very similar to how we described the use of JavaScript uh, and how, like you know, you can actually help improve the performance of JavaScript with the use of, like, let's say, Rust. Uh, you can actually uh, do similar things with uh, on the backend side, on the server side as well. So essentially, what you can do is you can offload all of your highly computational uh, functions and tasks uh, by, like, let's say, writing them in Rust and having them uh, in, and basically essentially compile them into this WebAssembly virtual machine, uh, which provides you a very secure uh, platform and a very secure environment in which you can actually execute your tasks. And you can sort of run this together with your Node.js application in order to really make your Node.js applications highly performant. And of course, uh, coming into the world of containers, uh, we know that Linux containers can be really large and can be really huge. And of course, when you have larger uh, containers, uh, they can actually have a really large spin, like, you know, uh, I, I mean, startup time as well. They will take more time to boot up. But uh, WebAssembly containers are usually uh, from magnitude of one to 100 times smaller as compared to your standard Linux containers. So uh, if you're actually planning to have some applications run on the edge, you can uh, use uh, the WebAssembly containers 
probably alongside your uh, Linux containers as well, uh, you can sort of build those kind of applications uh, to uh, run really performant applications on the edge. Because usually edge devices are uh, usually very uh, tightly bound in terms of uh, the overall footprint in terms of like the competition and also the size of these, uh, of, of these IoT or, or edge devices. And uh, I'd highly recommend all of you to sort of go through uh, the state of WebAssembly article. This sort of covers where exactly WebAssembly is today in uh, the entire uh, like in the spectrum of the ecosystem for WebAssembly in 2022. So I'll highly recommend to go through this, which sort of covers which are the languages that like you know today are uh, most popular when being used with WebAssembly, and especially from the distributed computing and from the uh, like you know from the IoT edge devices uh, spectrum. So I'll highly recommend you to go through this article uh, because today um, like you cannot just use your standard highly competition uh, languages like C++ or uh, Rust that can be compiled into WebAssembly but you can also use scripting languages like uh, Python or even JavaScript that can actually be compiled into WebAssembly. Uh, re very recently during PyCon uh, this year at the end of uh, April uh, there's a huge announcement for PyScript which essentially allows you to run Python on the browser with the help of WebAssembly. Uh, so these are some of the examples that uh, you can see to really see how vast the ecosystem from the uh, native browser to actually uh, seeing applications within Edge and uh, uh, like you know within uh, the uh, entire broad, broad spectrum of containers and server side you can actually see that uh, and you can this article is a really good one. Now we'll just go through some of the demos. Uh, of course, we are sort of slightly running out of time, so we'll just cover some of the uh, some of the demos that, uh, like you know, uh, I have just come across, and that sort of showcase the entire broad spectrum of how WebAssembly today is being utilized. Uh, so the first one is just running a simple WebAssembly file in the browser. So I'll just quickly go ahead and I will uh, go to my uh, VS Code. Now over here, what uh, we have is that. Uh, if you can see the web, uh, this particular VS code, I have three files. So the first one is the index.html. Essentially, this is the file where we'll be calling our WebAssembly byte uh, executable, uh, our WebAssembly module. And you can see two things. One is the WebAssembly uh, module itself, which is uh, ending with a dot wasm. And of course, you cannot see this because this is a large, like, you know, of course, you saw that how the hello world, uh, like, you know, example of how hello world in WebAssembly sort of looks like. But what you also see is uh, a little more easier way of sort of representing the WebAssembly, and that is the dot wat file. It's sort of a text file that sort of uh, like you know covers uh, what exactly is uh, defined within your WebAssembly file, and it's a little more easier to sort of understand. So what we can what we can see is that this example is sort of just giving an example for uh, being able to print hello world. So it will sort of just uh, print hello world from WebAssembly, and uh, this is what the function uh, would be. The hello world will be the sort of the function that will be will be will be initiated from this WebAssembly uh, module. And uh, essentially what we're doing is that we're going to be calling this within our index.html file. Over here, you can see this particular function, uh, which uh, uh, this, this specific one, which is WebAssembly.initiate streaming. So the way that like, you know, WebAssembly sort of works, especially when you're working with it on the browser is, so if you have probably worst, uh, worked with JSON uh, files, right? So you, you, you must be knowing that whenever you're loading, like let's say a uh, JSON file inside of your uh, web application, Usually, um, you have to wait until your entire JSON file has been imported, and then you are actually able to use it. But uh, the standard way in which uh, WebAssembly sort of works is that it sort of works in a streaming format. That means that as you actually load your WebAssembly module inside of your application, uh, it sort of gets compiled as it is like you know getting uh, inserted or it is getting fetched by your uh, application. So you don't have you don't have to actually wait for your entire WebAssembly module to actually get uh, like you know uh, get loaded. Uh, it sort of it's, it it does it in parts. So as your fragments of your module get uh, inside of your application or are they are fetched, you can easily just use them inside of your application. So uh, that that's also one of the major benefits as compared to like let's say JSON format uh, with WebAssembly. So essentially, what we're doing over here in the line number 26 is that we're initiating the streaming where we are actually fetching our WebAssembly module, which is the Hello World WASM file, and we are importing that, and then we are 
uh, basically uh, calling or we are initiating the uh, hello world function that we had defined in our what file. And essentially what it do is that once we basically are, we have completed the uh, initiating, uh, we have uh, loaded our WebAssembly module inside of our web application, we'll uh, basically run this function and we'll be able to see the output. So I'll just quickly go ahead and also uh, run this on a local, uh, just give me one second, I'll just go and click on the live server. And we should see if I just open up uh, the from the inspect element. Uh, let me just quickly see because it's a little hard to see from here. Or I'll just do control I command I. So command shift I I guess. Oh okay. Um, yeah, this is better. So if I just open the inspect element and if I go to the console, you you should see uh, it's saying hello world from WebAssembly. So essentially, this is how, like you know, we are essentially uh, taking a WebAssembly module and then initiating it inside of our web application. Now, uh, looking at some of the other examples, uh, I'll just quickly go over uh, to the demo too, and that is uh, doing machine learning inference on the browser. So, of course, uh, a lot of you might be aware that machine learning, right? Uh, of course, some of you might uh, be aware that it's really mathematics at the like at, at its core. Uh, so whether you're working with like, you know, KNN algorithm or you're working with neural networks, essentially you're having a lot of mathematics. Uh, for example, neural networks, they are basically represented in large vectors and large matrices. So whenever you're doing any kind of a machine learning inference, you're doing a lot of mathematical crunching at its core. Uh, so that's why, like, you know, being able to actually do machine learning on the browser is something that is really powerful. And um, normally for web browser, like, you know, for web developers or for machine learning developers uh, who want to actually, let's say, like, you know, import, uh, like, you know, like, let's say machine learning into their web application, uh, traditionally you would have to, like, let's say, use uh, a Django server or a Flux server, right? Um, and then I use that dedicated server. But today we have a lot of different uh, machine learning libraries like uh, TensorFlow.js which uh, allow you to actually write your machine learning models directly in JavaScript and uh, you can actually uh, preload some of your pre-existing models within JavaScript. And uh, to be able to run these machine learning models on the browser, there are mul multiple backends that are supported. So some of the ones that you can actually use is like, you know, use your native CPU or you could use something like WebGL. Uh, you have uh, WebAssembly as well as one of the supported backends that can be used alongside uh, your browser. So essentially what you can do is that you can do your entire machine learning inference on the browser. So uh, coming back to this example, this is essentially a TensorFlow.js model benchmark. So this is a tool that allows you to test multiple uh, machine learning models. So the one that uh, we are going to be using right now is going to be uh, the mobile net. It's a very popular machine learning model to be able to do uh, image inference. Uh, and over here, what you'll see is that uh, I can choose between different type of backends. So uh, just to sort of showcase the example of how fast uh, WebAssembly is in comparison to just using, like, let's say if you were not having WebAssembly and you were just having, let's say, your native uh, CPU uh, to do machine learning inference on the browser. So just remember that we are doing this inference on the browser itself and we are not having a dedicated hardware or we're not having a dedicated server where, doing our, where we are doing our machine learning inference. If I just uh, select the CPU and um, I will quickly just uh, go ahead and uh, test the connection. Uh, just to sort of show you uh, and runs, run this benchmark. So essentially what it's doing is it is loading the machine learning model inside of your browser and then it's running, or basically it's running your machine learning inference 50 times and you'll essentially see the time it actually takes to do this competition just with the help of the CPU. So of course, since it's just using the native CPU of your, of your system, so it will take some amount, of time, some amount of time to actually do that inference. And then we'll see that uh, result over here within this kernel section uh, that probably should uh, take some amount of time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, as we'll see that once we select WebAssembly as one of, so as you can see, that the time it actually took was 512 milliseconds, right? For to, the, to do the inference just using the native um, uh, CPU. Now if I choose the backend as WebAssembly, and if I do this and I run this benchmark, right? So you can see that it is super quick. On the magnitude of more than, I guess, close to 50 times, uh, yeah, I mean, probably 50 times. And you can see that the inference time that it actually took. So essentially what, again, we are doing is that you're, uh, you're loading your machine learning model onto your browser. At the same time, you're also uh, loading your WebAssembly executable, uh, your WASM uh, module. And all the inference for the uh, machine learning is being taken care by this WebAssembly executable. That is much more highly performant than your native uh, JavaScript. 
And that's what you can see over here in terms of uh, like, you know, the performance. Uh, and this is like, you know, a really great example of how the performance can also look like in terms of how fast you can actually do that. And uh, finally, the third example that I want to showcase is essentially being able to use WebAssembly as a function, as a service. That means that uh, what we're doing is that uh, your WebAssembly uh, has been uh, deployed onto a server, onto a serverless function, and uh, we are using function as a service, or essentially AI as a service. So uh, for example, uh, for that demo, I'll just quickly go to uh, this particular website. So this is a demonstration by a second state that uh, is like in the, uh, uh, the team behind the Wasimets project. So just uh, as an example, what we're doing over here is that your entire machine learning inference will take place on uh, a remote server where we have hosted our WebAssembly function. And uh, essentially what we are doing over here is that uh, there is a Node.js backend which uh, communicates with a Rust function. Uh, and this Rust function is what is actually going to be doing the web, like, you know, uh, is actually going to be doing the machine learning inference. And then that Rust function gets converted into the WASM uh, executable. And that's what then we communicate with our Node.js backend. So over here, I'll just quickly select, uh, a, I'll select a file. And I had just recently downloaded this uh, hot dog. And I'll just click on classify. And as you can see, like, of course, it's just doing this inference right now. And very soon, we should see, uh, as you can see, like, the output is a hot dog. And uh, basically, uh, in terms of what's very high is essentially the confidence score of the machine learning model that it is able to rate this uh, hot dog. Uh, and it has a very high confidence score, probably uh, greater than 85%. Uh, so this is an example where uh, the inference of the machine learning is not being done on the browser. Instead, we are having it uh, function as a service where the machine learning model or essentially the Rust code is being hosted as a function as a service in a serverless function. And uh, it's, uh, it has nothing to do with uh, being able to do machine learning inference on the browser. So like, let's say if you have a really large machine learning model, you could uh, like, you know, uh, take that machine learning model, have it deployed a server serverless function, and use a web assembly uh, as a serverless function and, and invoke that call like let's say with the help of a uh, with the help of a uh, front end that you can see over here so the idea overhead what i'm trying to convey is of course i mean this is this might sound to be a little more on like really heavy on uh, machine learning but you can similarly do these uh, things uh, as well for any other highly commercial tasks that you might actually come across that involve a lot of uh, mathematical crunching or numbers. And of course, uh, this particular demonstration is to showcase uh, that how you can actually use WebAssembly today on the uh, server side on using with containers, right? And so these are just some of the examples uh, that I just wanted to showcase. Uh, but yes, um, you can also just go through some of these resources. Uh, so of course, if you really want to get into the specifications uh, for uh, WebAssembly, you can visit the github.com slash WebAssembly. Today, WebAssembly is not like, you know, run by a single company. Uh, there's the Bytecode Alliance, which is being contributed by some of the largest uh, like, you know, companies in the world. And now WebAssembly is also supported by the W3C, which is the, like, you know, the web consortium. And, uh, uh, that's why, like, you know, um, WebAssembly today is not just on, on the web, but it's also beyond the web as well. And uh, you can also just uh, see some of these docs specifically for uh, things like awesome WebAssembly that, uh, that has a lot of really great resources that you can actually look at um, for anything related to WebAssembly. That's like, you know, some of the courses or some of the applications that have been built with the help of WebAssembly. But yeah, with that in mind, uh, that sort of uh, concludes my talk. Of course, uh, there's a lot of information to be uh, shared today in this session. But I hope that this sort of gives you a general idea about why WebAssembly today is like, you know, so popular. And uh, I mean, it's a technology that is not just like, you know, on the browser, right? It's way beyond the browser as well. And that's why, like, you know, a lot of exciting times for WebAssembly, a lot of great things happening on the container side. Of course, uh, we have the folks from Fermin as well who are, like, you know, using it and Wasm uh, Cloud, who are ba basically uh, revolutionizing how we basically create uh, services um, on uh, and very easily to spin up these services. So, yeah, with that, I'll conclude my talk. And if you want to connect with me on uh, Twitter, you can connect with me on Hardelup. And now I'm more than happy to take up any questions. Thank you so much.
Okay, so that's a good question. So first of all, just to repeat the question, uh, the question is that is polyglot programming uh, possible with WebAssembly? So uh, traditionally, how like you know you'll take WebAssembly executable is that you'll take one of your target languages and uh, you'll use WebAssembly as your compilation target. So normally, what will happen is that you you'll have of course one language, for example, like let's say just Rust, and you can compile it into that WebAssembly bytecode. But of course, if you have like let's say multiple services that you are using inside of your application, inside of your entire uh, framework that you are building, uh, then of course you can take multiple uh, like you know languages and compile them into the separate WebAssembly uh, bytecodes. So that way it's possible in terms of like you know supporting multiple languages. Yep, please. I'm really sorry I couldn't hear the question. Can we get a mic? Okay, uh, so I would say that top three top three players. It sort of also depends on whether you're uh, like. So the question is, what who are the top three players in terms of WebAssembly today? Well, I mean, uh, the question I would like to sort of expand the question and sort of also speak in terms of. Uh, for what particular type of application you're trying to use WebAssembly for. So if in terms of you're looking at WebAssembly in terms of uh, like, you know, the, f uh, the browser. So I would say that like, you know, companies like uh, Figma, Adobe, right, they are uh, utilizing WebAssembly to the full core uh, to be able to support large, uh, like, you know, highly computational tasks like being able to do uh, photo editing, video editing, or UI design editing uh, using these tools. Uh, now, if you look at from the server side space, uh, today we have a lot of companies like Fermion, uh, Wasm, uh, Cosmonic, right, uh, which are revolutionizing uh, the way in which, uh, like, you know, applications are deployed or they sort of spin up uh, with the help of uh, WebAssembly. So um, there are a wide spectrum of uh, applications that today WebAssembly uh, is being utilized in. And today, a lot of, like, you know, uh, game engines are also porting over their games into the browser with the help of WebAssembly. So uh, there's a very easy way in which you can actually uh, basically uh, compile your, uh, like let's say your Unity application into a WebAssembly, WebGL executable and then run those. So a lot of uh, exciting times within the space of WebAssembly, uh, whether it's like, you know, uh, application related to uh, machine learning and even uh, there are a lot of different companies like, let's say, uh, especially in the decentralized space, uh, uh, writing smart contracts, so Solana is also using uh, WebAssembly as well. So in the Web3, in the crypto space, uh, they are also using uh, WebAssembly for like you know using decentralized applications. Please go. Yeah, so first of all, uh, thank you so much for the question. The question is that uh, when would you try to decide uh, when to actually use WebAssembly for running server-side applications? Or instead of using, like, let's say, a Docker container, uh, when to actually use a WebAssembly container? So uh, as I had described that, uh, one of the biggest advantages for WebAssembly is that uh, when we look at the standard way in which WebAssembly containers behave, they're having a smaller, much smaller uh, blueprint in terms of both the memory and in terms of how quickly they can actually load. Now, um, so that's why when it comes to any kind of a, uh, application when you're, like, let's say, trying to run it on an edge device or, like, let's say, on IoT, that's where you can actually use WebAssembly containers as compared to Linux containers. And also, uh, another example that I'd like to uh, give is uh, with respect to, like, let's say, um, the, and this is a really good uh, conclusion to this particular question, is that you can actually run your WebAssembly containers side by side with the help of, uh, alongside your Linux containers as well. Because there are certain uh, limitations when it comes to the WebAssembly containers, because as I mentioned that WebAssembly on its own cannot really do anything, right? Uh, and of course, the supported tool chains that are there with WebAssembly, those are somewhat limiting. But if you are able to run them alongside, like, let's say, the Docker containers as well, instead of, like, let's say, Kubernetes uh, cluster, um, you can utilize those uh, tool chains that are uh, there prevalent with the Docker containers and use them alongside with your web, uh, WebAssembly uh, applications as well. So just a part of, like, let's say, your application which uh, is being run on an edge device can be offloaded uh, to your uh, WebAssembly container, 
while the rest of the application can be run alongside that Docker container. So that's also one of the architectures that you can actually follow uh, to uh, successfully run your uh, applications on the server side. So uh, the question is, what kind of CI/CD tooling is available for WebAssembly? So it kind of depends. Um, in, in terms of uh, just to, trying to understand the question, in terms of like, yeah. Okay, so essentially what you have is your WebAssembly module, right? Uh, at the end of the day, what you're doing is that uh, you're taking your target languages, which are like, let's say, C++ or Rust, and you're compiling it into WebAssembly.